Straight ahead, face off. State Representative Craig Goldman and businessman John O'Shea duke it out in next month's Republican primary runoff for the 12th Congressional District in North Texas. They each tell us why they're the better candidate and discuss their priorities. Up to the states, two women from North Texas who serve in Congress react to presumed Republican presidential nominee, former President Donald Trump's position, that abortion rights should be a state, not a federal issue. Yes or no, Frisco voters will go to the polls to decide whether firefighters deserve civil service protections and collective bargaining, or if it's a budget buster. Good Sunday morning to you. I'm Jack Fink. Get your fix for Texas politics. Eye on politics starts now. Hello and welcome to Ion Politics. I hope you're having a great weekend so far. And we begin with the face off in next month's Republican primary for the 12th Congressional District in much of Fort Worth, Tarrant, and Parker counties. State Representative Craig Goldman of Fort Worth and businessman John O'Shea are vying for this open seat after a longtime Congresswoman Kay Granger announced she's retiring at the end of her term this year. This is a Republican majority district, and so whoever wins May 28th is likely to win in the general election in November. First, we'll hear from Craig Goldman, who's endorsed by Governor Greg Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, and Fort Worth Mayor Matty Parker, among others. He tells us why he believes he's the better candidate. Well, the difference is very clear. I have a proven conservative voting record, uh, 10 years worth, um, in the Texas State House, and my opponent has no record of doing anything. Um, and so it's very clear, I mean, whether it's pro-life issues, whether it's Second Amendment, where we may constitutional carry the law of the state of Texas, where it's spending billions of dollars to defend our Texas border. I've done it. I've been a part of it. I've been a leader in the Texas State House helping to make those things happen. So if you're elected, what are your top three priorities? Well, top three is, is pretty simple. One, border. I mean, our... <laughs> Uh, hopefully I won't be working with the Biden administration, let's put it that way. Hopefully I'll be working with Donald, President Donald Trump and his administration and, and, and we can work together to solve the horrific mess that the Biden administration has left behind in the state. Uh, we literally have Border Patrol, I was just down there about a month ago, and we literally have Border Patrol agents being told, stand down, don't do the jobs you're being paid to do. And they're demoralized and, and they're not allowed to do that. And so because of the billions of dollars that the Texas State Legislature has authorized and passed for Governor Abbott to use, we have been able to have Texas State Guard and our DPS troopers be down there and set up rail cars and razor wire and be a deterrent for those crossing the border and telling them you're not going to come across our border, go somewhere else. And we see that happening. They have said, our DPS troopers and our Texas Guard has said, that has been a major difference maker um, and limiting the number of people crossing that border every single day. So uh, that by far is issue number one. Issue number two is dealing with our budget and our deficit. $34 trillion, we, we are in a deficit in our federal government. That's ridiculous. We should not be in debt. Um, and we don't do that in Texas. We balance our budget every single session in Texas. In fact, we had a $30 billion surplus. We have $20 billion in our rainy day fund. The way we do it in Texas is the right way, and it should be the national model, and I'm gonna go work to make sure it's the national model. And uh, do you have a third, or are those your top two? Well, really, those are the top two that I'm, I'm gonna focus on. Well, the third, of course, is, is representing this district is making sure we have a strong defense. Lockheed Martin is the number one employer in this district. Over 19,000 employees go to work there every single day, mostly working on building the F-35 and, and other things, uh, the support for the F-35. We have to continue to have a strong national defense and represent in this district especially. Um, that certainly is going to be a top priority as well. Abortion rights. Uh, Democrats are trying to make this a, a campaign issue from the Biden administration on down. And Democrats want to codify Roe v. Wade in Congress. Um, I would imagine you would disagree with that. Um, but some of, on the flip side, Republicans have said they they'd like to pass a national ban on abortion. Um, others say leave it to the states. Where are you on that? I, first of all, I'm very proud of my pro-life record. Um, and we certainly have passed very strong pro-life legislation in the Texas State House. Um, it, it was quite interesting when we passed the heartbeat bill several sessions ago. 
Uh, even some Democrats, some friends of mine, of course I won't say who, are like, this is a very tough vote for me because, you know, we're being told to vote no on this, but personally, I'm for it. Uh, I would love to see a federal heartbeat bill passed um, I would, because the second a heartbeat is detected, uh, I believe life begins at conception, but as soon as a heart is detected, it's very hard to convince somebody that, uh, that, that a person should be allowed to have an abortion once a heartbeat is, is detected. So in Texas, that's about six weeks, right? Right. Um, and that's what you would support nationally? I, I would support, absolutely, I would support that nationally. Now we'll hear from John O'Shea, who's endorsed by Attorney General Ken Paxton and Texas Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller, among others. We asked him why he believes he's the better candidate. The gentleman who is my opponent right now in the primary has been in the state house for the last 10 years and has been part of the house leadership. I would say is viewed more as part of the Republican establishment, whereas I tend to fall under more of the America first kind of Ken Paxton wing of the Republican Party. And I think you know there is a bit of a civil war in the Texas Republican Party right now. And I think having voters have a binary choice as to whether or not they would rather return back to the more establishment kind of George Bush wing of the Republican Party or more of the America first Donald Trump, Ken Paxton wing of the party, we now have the ability to offer that choice to the voters. What are your top three priorities if you're to be elected? Well, the first one is securing our border. I mean, a country without a border is, is not a country at all, and especially when you have this wave of misery that accompanies it. I mean, it's, it's an issue of not only immigration, but national security. We've basically ceded control of not just the border, but the interior as well to the cartels, and that includes the fentanyl trafficking and the deaths that includes the human trafficking, which unfortunately has become a very prominent problem, even in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, if you speak to law enforcement. Number two is we need to get a handle on this spending in government. I mean, it's, well, actually, in, in fact, I'd break this up into two parts. We need to unleash our energy industry first. I think that we have kind of moved into this green new energy deal where we're not only raising our own uh, energy costs, the government subsidizing it, but we're also now dependent on solar panels, wind turbines, lithium processing and batteries that all come from primarily China, which clearly is a country that is not viewing us in a favorable light at this point. So why we put our energy dependence on a non-reliable intermittent source that has to be subsidized by the government and puts inflationary pressure on our country and then the second part of that is the government spending. I mean, it's this wanton spending. We can't seem to get back to pre-COVID spending, even though COVID is behind us, so to speak, as far as like a, a crisis that we don't understand or have our hands around. And yet, you know, we're still spending in the six and a half, seven trillion dollars a year, running up deficits at a time when interest rates are going up, putting further pressure on our, our budget as a government. So the other thing that I would say that's really of importance to me is getting back to our constitutional roots. When they can take away our God-given rights, the whole basic founding premises of our country and our constitution, and then they actually are the government, both state and federal, can be the greatest threat to our rights then we don't have anything left to conserve. We have to restore, and we have to go back to our founding principles. And so I'm wondering where are you as it relates to a proposed national ban on abortion, or if you believe that the states should be the ones to make this decision? I do think that while a ban on abortion is not realistic, uh, or, or like I said, what, where the country is at right now, I do think that pro-life isn't viewed as radical. It is this abortion up to and you know upon delivery or even a botched abortion to be able to terminate the life of the child. So there is some common ground where I think the vast majority of Americans concede that, you know what, we're not okay with per partial birth abortions or we're not okay with third trimester abortions. And so I think if the federal government were to look at some kind of way to codify something that the vast majority of Americans are okay with some limited restrictions, then me being pro-life would see that as a, as a win and a, the ability to save some children's lives. 
Either O'Shea or Goldman will face Democrat Trey Hunt in November. Coming up, two women from North Texas who serve in Congress react to presumed Republican presidential nominee, former President Donald Trump's position on abortion rights. And then later, Frisco voters will decide whether to approve civil service protections and collective bargaining for this growing suburb's firefighters. Eye on Politics, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Ion Politics. Now up to the states. This week, the presumed Republican presidential nominee and former President Donald Trump made headlines when he announced abortion rights should be a state issue and not a federal issue. Now it's up to the states to do the right thing. Like Ronald Reagan, I am strongly in favor of exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. You must follow your heart of this issue. As we've been reporting on this show for weeks now, President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris are making abortion rights a major part of their re-election campaign, and so are Democrats in down-ballot races in Texas and across the country. Trump declined to back a national ban on abortion that some Republicans favor. Democrats want to turn protections once held under Roe v. Wade into federal law. We spoke with two women from North Texas who serve in Congress, Republican Beth Van Dyne, but we begin with Democrat Jasmine Crockett of Dallas, who tells us she wants a federal law to go further than Roe v. Wade. Just imagine, why would we write a law in 2024 based on what we knew in 1973? We wouldn't. But that law was giving us the base protections that basically said, you have a right to privacy. We're going to make sure that we have protections as it relates to not just abortion care, but we've got to look out for um, mifepristone, which obviously is abortion care as well, but also um, as it relates to birth control, because we do believe that that's going to be next. We've got to look at the full gambit, IVF. We've got to make sure that we've got protections for that. So these are things that I would say would go beyond the scope of just kind of the generic Roe v. Wade case, but we've got to make sure that we protect women's health care as a whole. Now we hear from Republican Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne of the 24th District on why she agrees with former President Trump that abortion rights should be left up to the states. I have said for, for a long time that I believe it's the states as is constitutionally decided by the Supreme Court. It's the issue for the states to decide. You know, I know a lot of people want to jump in and say that the federal government should be taking this role, but they've got to think about, you know, bills that have gotten passed um, out of the House of Representatives when it was a Democrat majority. And I was on the floor of the House when all but one Democrat voted for an abortion um, up until the moment of birth at taxpayer expense. And I think those are very extreme uh, conditions. I think those are very extreme policies that the majority of Americans don't support. And I do believe, you know, again, as the Dobbs case has, has uh, put an exclamation point behind, this is an issue for states to decide. Also this week, Congresswoman Van Dyne paid for a full page ad that ran in the New York Post encouraging law enforcement officers to, quote, escape New York and move to Texas. Van Dyne says she paid for the ad using her campaign funds. She listed 15 law enforcement agencies in the DFW area looking for officers. I wanted to make sure that they understood they've got a home in Texas that where we revere, we respect, we appreciate the job that they do. We are growing. We're one of the fastest growing areas of the, of the country, fastest growing state in the country. We've got those job openings. More higher ed workers at state universities and colleges are losing their jobs in the aftermath of a new state law. The president of UT Dallas announced on Tuesday that the university is closing its Office of Campus Resources and Support and letting go 20 of its workers to comply with SB 17. That's a new controversial state law that bans public institutions from supporting diversity, equity and inclusion, or DEI, activities and programs. The news comes just a week after UT Austin fired more than 60 employees who had worked for DEI programs on campus. Coming up, Frisco voters will soon decide whether to give their growing city's firefighters civil service protections and collective bargaining. Why the city's leaders are on the opposite side of the firefighters when Eye on Politics returns.
A lot of focus has been on the November general elections, but before that, Texas is holding municipal elections on May 4th. Municipal elections are when cities and school districts have general elections for voters to weigh in on bonds and ballot initiatives and to choose members for their governing bodies. Some of the more common positions that require municipal elections are mayor, council member, and school board member. Early voting begins a week from tomorrow on April 22nd. Well, as you just saw, the next big election is May 4th for nonpartisan municipal and school board races. In the fast-growing city of Frisco, voters will have to decide yes or no on two ballot propositions that have placed the Firefighters Association at odds with council members and the mayor. We're talking about Props A and B, which will impact the city's 250-plus firefighters and could shape the city's fire protection in the future. We took an oath to do what we felt was right for our citizens and our firemen, and that's what we're doing. So. Frisco Firefighters Association President Matthew Sapp says after city leaders rejected using meet and confer to set their wages and benefits, their members decided to go directly to the residents. We got 6,000 signatures from our citizens to put Proposition A and B on the ballot. So, you know, if we have to fight at the political level and take it to the voters, you know, that's just what we're going to do. If approved by voters May 4th, Prop A would institute civil service protections for firefighters, which would provide set rules for hiring, firing and promotions and establish a citizens committee. Prop B would provide collective bargaining over pay, benefits and workplace conditions between firefighters and the city. And if they can't agree, it would go to arbitration. Lockouts and strikes are not allowed under state law. The concerns for staffing, because we're not running the national staffing standard, uh, we're running about 62 minimum. We should be running about 78 firefighters on duty at any given time. Uh, and then our response time is kind of ballooning. Uh, so, yeah, I am part of a group, Safety First Frisco, uh, that is leading the charge on the vote no campaign for this. Bill Woodard, a Frisco City Council member since 2016, opposes both propositions, along with Mayor Jeff Cheney, the other council members, and the Frisco Chamber of Commerce. Woodard says the city doesn't need collective bargaining and civil service. Frisco is a target right now. We're the largest city uh, in the state of Texas without civil service and collective bargaining in some form or fashion. Um, so I think that's why you know we're being targeted right now and we're growing to be a bigger city, but Frisco doesn't need the big city problems that union brings. Sapp says this is not an effort to boost salaries and benefits, instead to boost staffing to keep up with the city's growth which includes the new PGA Headquarters Resort and golf courses, along with the new Universal Kids Resort theme park and hotel. I think that if you look at the fact that we've been increasing in population, we've been increasing in size uh, and just the scope of what we're building in Frisco, but we haven't added a firefighter in three or four years, that, that should give some people concerns. Zapp says the department needs 36 additional firefighters over a period of time so they can add a fourth firefighter to each engine and truck on each of the department's three shifts. The city says that will cost more than $7.2 million. So if you have more firefighters, then your response times can be better. They right. want more staffing. They sure. say it's inadequate. Right. How do you respond to that? It's not inadequate. Um, we have an ISO 1 rating. Uh, our fire department is certified by the National Accrediting Agency. We're in the top 1% of fire uh, departments nationwide. Um, if we were understaffed, we wouldn't have those accreditations. On its website, the city says out of the more than 27,000 professional and voluntary fire departments in the U.S., Frisco is one of only 117 agencies to be both internationally accredited and awarded the ISO 1 rating which the city says helps home and business owners receive lower insurance costs. Woodard acknowledges the city's response times have increased slightly recently. He says the answer is to continue building new fire stations. The city will add 12 firefighters when Fire Station 10 opens near the PGA headquarters in the spring of 2025. Fire Station 11 is being designed now and will open a couple of years later. So you think the addition of fire stations, which obviously you'll need to hire to staff those, right? Exactly. You're yeah. saying that is the solution to the, the response times. Absolutely, because you put the equipment and the personnel closer to where it needs to be when a call comes in. You say on your website that this wouldn't necessarily increase costs. It's not going to raise ta it's not going to raise taxes. Yeah. But I mean, if, if a city has to staff up, 
And if yes. a third party arbitration panel gets to work with uh, firefighters and, and the city managers, I mean, you are looking at, at costs going up, right? Yeah, of course. Staffing would cost city money, regardless of what department it's in. Uh, I think the the goal, of course, of us and the hope would be the city is to find a collaborative effort to how that staffing comes to pass. If we Woodard says he's worried that if approved, collective bargaining would end up in arbitration and could bust the city's budget. And then you've got a third party arbiter who's not going to live in the city of Frisco. He's not going to know anything about the city of Frisco, what we've built or the way we operate. He's going to make a decision and that decision is binding on everybody at that point. That gives council two choices. If it doesn't fit in the budget, then they either have to raise the taxes or they have to start cutting services in other departments. You can watch the full interviews of everyone featured on our program today on our website, cbsnewstexas.com, in the Eye on Politics section. That's all for Eye on Politics today. I'm Jack Fink. I am listening and we are listening at CBS News Texas. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you again next week. And from all of us here, have a great rest of your weekend.